Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're going to get started right on time today. We have a couple presentations. First is by one of our founding fathers, Dr. Crandall, on uh, <laughs> of the Moran, of the Moran. I didn't say grandfather. Um, and he's going to talk about minimally invasive uh, glaucoma procedures. And then Adam Guess, who's one of our new cornea fellows coming to us from uh, CPMC, is going to talk about the patient that I hope everybody had a chance to at least take a brief look at upstairs, a uh, young lady with Ehlers-Danlos. Thanks. Thanks. All right. I just wanted to kind of update people on what's going on in the glaucoma sphere because really lots of things are changing. And with the recent uh, FDA approval of iStent, I thought I'd just bring up a couple, bring up the, uh, talk a little bit about the iStent and then a little bit about uh, some of the new um, procedures that we're involved in. We'll be starting phase two trials in, in two new uh, glaucoma devices pretty soon. So, uh, you know, what w if you look at glaucoma surgery in the past, you know, it basically, if you, if you actually look at a trabeculectomy done in 1973, say, um, let's say 76, because in 73, most of them were still shave procedures, uh, and then look at the procedure now, there, there, are, there really isn't a lot of difference. I mean, basically, it's the same technique. Originally, Karen's described the trab as a, a five by five flap. Uh, and uh, a much larger adectomy than we do. So the main modulations that we've been doing uh, in over the past 30 years have been at the healing end, uh, mitomycin, sponges, smaller tubes, uh, or smaller um, PIs, no PIs, all sorts of stuff. But basically, the trabeculectomy has been the, the, the and still is, the, the gold standard um, with the problem. The problem with it is, of course, is the long-term uh, complication rates. If you look at studies, uh, we do quite well for two to four years, and uh, most average TRABs last about eight and a half to 12 years, which is um, uh, okay if you're, d if you're dealing with 75, 80 year olds, but certainly uh, uh, many of our patients are in the younger group, and you all, you, you all see these up there, dysthetic blebs, uh, leaking blebs, uh, uh, you know, uncomfortable, uh, hypotenuse maculopathy, and uh, the worst, of course, would be uh, endophthalmitis. And so the, the, the problem is we'd like to really work at where the pathology is, which is in the juxtacanalicular tissue, and see if we can work in that. And we've been working on this for about 20 years, and there have been about five steps uh, backwards and maybe six steps forward. I don't know, one of those two. Uh, and the question is, what do you think will happen in 10 years? And we probably will still be doing TRABs, a uh, variation of it. Uh, there we have now two supracortal drainage implants, one that's uh, the gold shunt, and I'll show you that, and then the one that's the new one that we'll be doing, which is a, which is a variation of that. It's called the I-PASS, and that's, uh, that's in phase three trials in Europe, and we'll, we will be part of the phase two trial here. And there'll probably be uh, newer glaucoma procedures that will, will do it. So if we look at the, uh, in the past, you know, because of the long-term complications, uh, surgery was basically a, a last result, uh, or excuse me, last resort. And, um, but if you look at all the big trials that have been done, it's been basically shown that the long-term, um, doesn't matter how you get the pressure down, uh, as long as you get it below 17 and almost all the time, you got about a 90% chance in most cases of not losing in any further vision. Um, from the from glaucoma and if you get it down to 12 it jumps up to about 92 93 percent chance moving the the low tension glaucomas out of the picture just statistically on on the average ones but so you know what is what yeah, most everybody that leaves does in uh, general ophthalmology actually they were uh, the surgery has really dropped off as we as we've had more potent uh, uh, anti glaucoma meds such as the prostaglandins and the Combigan, Cosopt, all those new drops. And uh, so most people end up out of practice about five to 10 um, trabs by the time they're done, which is technically, I think, enough to do it. But a lot of people d for many years did not do it. So, uh, so a lot of the glaucoma people like Norman and Jason and I, everybody would refer cases into so that their skills actually were getting uh, fairly minimal although the cataract skills were, were still quite good. And the new devices are really, I think, aiming at the cataract surgeon. We'll talk a little bit, that's a political issue too as well. The American Glaucoma Society tends to back 
back off on some of these, these issues. But uh, the problem with TRABS and everything that we've done in the past is it truly is not physiological. If you think about it, you're basically making a hole. It, you know, if you go back, you could go back to Elliot's stuff where they basically did a tree find in the sclera uh, or the Fugo blade where you make a hole transclerally. I mean, these, that's basically what you're trying to do. And the whole time, really what you're trying to do is, is depend. You depend on that, but you fight it. It's kind of a weird combination. If you don't get it, you get hypotony. If you get too much of it, then it, then it seals down. So what you, the, the art of glaucoma surgery is really not in the technical aspect of doing the surgery. It, it counts, but that isn't the biggest deal. The biggest deal is the post-op uh, management and 5-FU suture lysis. We use mitomycin in the clinic now, uh, subtenons. So there's lots of things that we do to modulate the healing process. Uh, but if you look at it, I mean, you look at the, the complication rate. This was a retrospective study it's that uh, Gary Congdon in Pittsburgh did. And uh, he's a great surgeon. These are his cases. But it, that's a pretty, pretty ugly co uh, complication file, um, profile. So, you know, those are, those are not um, things to be uh, forgotten about quite, quite surgically. So what we want to do, if we can come up with something that we can avoid a bleb, and increase uh, outflow, it would be nice. And that's basically where, we're, where most of the research is going into right now. And I'll show you a couple of things as we, as we go further down. Uh, there's a, there also, we, we do use ECP here, um, and it is very helpful in some cases. It's, it's less predictable, it causes a lot of inflammation post-op, at least initially. And uh, since it t probably truly doesn't, destroy the, the ciliary body as an as a external diode does. It tends to be somewhat, uh, oh, three to five year range, maybe six years. But again, these are usually in eyes that have retinal issues or have other issues. I think uh, about the last 10 that we've done here have all been co uh, combined with, with the retina service. Uh, and then of course, the we always modified uh, TRABS. Tube shunts, the tube versus ta TRABS study, which was not a good study, as everybody knows. They took, uh, the, to get into it, you had to have already failed a TRAB. So it wasn't their best shot at TRAB's best shot. It was people that already failed. And the outcome was fairly similar, although the five-year data s somewhat supports the uh, tube uh, group in that setting. But, um, and there are certainly people that, that go right to tubes. If you live in Miami, you're probably going to get a tube if you have pressure of 30. That's, that's it. That's what they do. Uh, we're less, rel we're more reluctant to do that because of the su success we can do with the, um, most of the of our population here, which is Caucasian, not uh, African American or Cuban, which has a slightly different profile. So, <coughs> let's look at some some ways of of doing that. If we look at uh, subcon flow, that's that you know, which would be similar to what we have. The the um, the non-penetrating would fit into that category, fugo blades, transciliary filtration, the mini shunt, and the MIDI, which is out of Miami. We'll talk just quickly show that. If you look at trabecular flow, and this is where people are really getting uh, interested right now, uh, the I pass, which is which is the study that we will be doing here, uh, visco cantilosa, which which we've been doing here for 15 years, 20 years, trabectome, and then. The ELT, ELT is tied up in, in litigation right now. It's a, it's a patent fight between um, Michael Berlin and LA and uh, the German company. And so we, the US, we have not, we ha don't have it available. It'll probably be five years before it is available. But it is, it is a way of doing it. And then trabecular enhancement, Schlem's Canal, sterile spacing procedures, which are really done for, originally for uh, presbyopia, but also noted some at least somewhat uh, lower flow, I mean increased outflow. And then uh, the gold chunt, which, uh, is Nick here? I don't think he's here, I haven't seen you. But oh, there he is. Uh, Nick, uh, you have two of those gold chunts, is that correct? And do you want to just describe what you saw, which was, uh, I think, a surprise to everybody. Is 
not there's not very many in is the problem. It's such a pretty high rate. Right. And the interesting thing too, too was because it was gold, it did not require, uh, w they didn't require the phase one studies. So they allowed them to go right to phase two studies, which was interesting. So they didn't have a safety profile on the gold shunt, even though, and it, and so the I pass is actually material that's similar to, to cardiac stents. And it is much more biocompatible. They have a lot of rabbit studies and they have a lot of, of uh, initial, uh, reasonably good results. It's very quick, very easily easy to do. Uh, it's a really interesting study, but it, we'll be starting that pretty soon. So just quickly, uh, everybody knows about the eye stent, I mean the mini shunt, excuse me, and it's a small tube. It was originally designed for third world ophthalmology, uh, which, which was, it was supposed to be a two minute procedure that you could do, and it was basically uh, under uh, conge, it was not, was not under a scleral flap, and uh, basically would put a nail inside the eye and it would drain. Now it did work sh short term, but because of the sh location, there were lots of erosions and there was not, uh, the success rate in, in the third world was actually quite low. Um, and so it was abandoned for that. But uh, Optinol at the time, which was then ultimately bought out by Alcon, talked to a number of surgeons and Marlene Moster and, uh, and Leon Herndon, Moster at Wills, Herndon at, uh, at Duke, did a couple of studies looking at it under flaps, and it turns out that it, there are some advantages to it. It's pretty easy to, to place, and so we, uh, that's something I've been doing a lot of. The advantage from, from a surgical standpoint is you don't really, you don't have to make the ectomy portion of it. You put, you're putting this under a flap, and um, what it does then is it, it, it has a consistent outflow. Uh, some people feel it's too much, uh, so they c they're trying to modulate the the, the lumen size, but uh, if you seal it down pretty well, and then you can suit your lysis later, it, it actually works pretty well, and you don't have to do aerodectomies. But for the most part, we've not been doing the aerodectomies, uh, certainly on pseudophagic eyes or in eyes that we're doing combines or in high myopes for uh, at least 10 years and have had no complications. But actually, most glaucoma guys do, do uh, uh, excuse me, do do an aerodectomy routinely, and there's inflammation and Iphemus and stuff. So, if we and then we also look at some of the, we still do a variation of the viscocanalostomy, which was Robert Stegman out of, out of uh, uh, South Africa, and deep sclerectomy with a collagen implant. Now, the deep sclerectomy with collagen implant is still the, the number one procedure now done both in France and in Switzerland and parts of Germany. So, it, it has lost its momentum in the United States but it's still uh, a very highly used procedure in the rest of the world. So, and we, uh, we have a lot of those basically. This is similar to what we did last night to the guys that were there last night. We had to remove a, a tumor, a um, malignant melanoma, just a very small one that, uh, that uh, was found. It was about a two millimeters by two millimeters. So what, what, it, what, what I did was basically this. You, d you do a scleral flap like you're doing a trab, then you dissect a second flap, which is this one. So the trap flap is this, the inner wall is this, and last night I went all the way down to, to uh, choroidal, right, right here, and then we peeled that off and pop popped out the, the tumor. This is the inner wall of Schlem's Canal, and you can actually peel that off. If you peel that off, you still have about 20 microns of, 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 of uh, tissue under it, but uh, it does permeate through that, and that's the theory that you're reducing that uh, resistance to outflow at that level. It's not, it's not as difficult as it looks to peel that. You can see here beautifully, this, this is, uh, uh, again, Schlem's canal. This is Desimé's membrane. Uh, this would be scleral spur right here. Um, so it's, it's technically uh, difficult to do, and that's why one of the reasons why it hasn't taken off. It's, uh, it, but if you do it well, it works quite well. And we used we did a collagen implant. This came out of Russia. Originally, when it was designed, there have been lots of different ones. There's now one called Ologen, which is a material that fits right into the scleral flap and creates a lake, a lake effect. And this one, the collagen lasts about six months, and then it's gone and produces a scleral lake. And but uh, 
theoretically you get outflow through there, same as you would through a trab. And this is one where the where the I've done a uh, uh, laser. Uh, you, what you can do is a laser gonio photo. I'll show you. I Ike has a nice picture here that I'll show you in just a second. So you really get you get through the collector channels, so it's similar to a visco canalostomy, subcon, so it's similar to uh, trabeculectomy, and supracortal, so it's similar to uh, the other mechanisms. So, and they do work quite well, but again, they're they're technically difficult. Uh, the theory was, of course, to reduce cataract, which it did, inflammation, and hypotony, which it certainly did. But most people found it just the learning curve is pretty steep. This is one of ours about uh, five years post-op. This is an uh, inner wall. You look at, you can see the Decimase window here, and you can actually laser that. It's so thin. Just use a YAG laser with with a little bit <coughs> a little bit of power right in that area, and then you can you can pop right through. This is pre, this is post, uh, YAG. So you so you can do it as a staged procedure, if you will. When the when the pressure starts to ra raise, and then Sharaway and uh, Mar Marmoods, who have the world's biggest uh, groups that uh, about 50% of theirs end up being uh, converted into this but uh, you know the the complication rate is very low so they get a, they get a high high rate and that's the Swiss and uh, Egyptian groups and then uh, uh, Jason and Ike and I did a meta-analysis of the data and it shows it really does work so <coughs> now we're trying to look at ways to really work at this level here Schlem's canal outflow uh, and that's what most of the devices are are look at. So if we look quickly, I won't, we have a ton of stuff, but I want to show you a little bit about the eye stent and the trabectome and possibly uh, variations of ELT, which we hope will be available. This is a patient of mine. We did a, this is the eye pass. Now the eye pass, never, it, it, did, it did make FDA, it had a, a approval but it wasn't it wasn't significant enough. So basically, what we were doing was 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 like a cardiac stent. We put to these. This is uh, silicone, and the new materials are not silicone. The new, the the eye pass and the others are really cardiac, much more biocompatible, and don't don't clog like this actually did. And so we just make a sort of a scleral flap, same kind of level, open Schlem's canal, and stick the two stick these two tubes into. Schlem's canal, like a like a stent, and then this went in into the anterior chamber. So you would make a small little uh, uh, three or four hundred micron incision to put it in. This is one of the patients right at the time of surgery, and you can easily see the the blood. As a, so when whenever the pressure drops, blood gets into Schlem's canal. It's a good way to to identify the anatomy if you're doing goniotomies or you're doing eye stents. You can usually when the pressure is low. The, the uh, slim spills with blood, and that was the show that it was in fact working quite well. This is a, a view internally. You can see this. Uh, this is what we're looking for. Watch what happens when the pressure. This is from Robert Stegman. There it is. That's blood in Schlem's canal. And the interesting thing is that you can you can even identify both heart rates, and you can identify outflow in this video. I think it's this. Stegman is the only one in the world that has this video. It's, it's a hundred thousand dollar camera, and uh, he's he's it, it was only designed for him, and they only made one, <laughs> so nobody else <laughs> can get it. But it's uh, amazing to see what's going on in Schlem's canal. You can really see the anatomy quite quite beautifully. I think I don't know if anybody's seen it. And here's this. There's the collector channel. Now, why is that important? It turns out that if you put an eye stent near the outflow, one or two of them work well. If you happen to put it away, it doesn't work well. And that's the reason for the, the eye stent on steroids, which will be known as Hydrus. That's our study. And I'll show you that in just a second. So uh, as we look at the outflow, that's what we're looking at is that these, these little aqueous things that we're filling with the, with the fluid. These are die cast. Um, if you look at outflow, this is out of uh, the Oregon group. These are macaw monkeys, I believe, but it's fa fairly similar. So again, we're looking at trying to figure out how to get past this juxtacanalicular tissue, which is right here. And that seems to be the outflow. Everybody still believes that's where the problem is. So let's look at ways to do that. One of the ways was, was viscocanalostomy, which is what Stegman did. Now his population is different from anybody's in the world. 
It turns out genetically and I, uh, that if you have pure African blood, no Caucasian, nothing else, it's a very aggressive type of, of glaucoma. So in South Africa, he would have patients that would come in mid-30s, uh, 0.99 top pressures of 50. And we, we just don't see that very often. And uh, we, we were actually going out with uh, Hageman, Hageman's group to, because there was two or three generations we, we can, that the segment's gonna get for. And <coughs> we hope to isolate that gene uh, because it would be really important because there's just nobody else. That there's no other place that I know of where, where you see that kind of, <coughs> of a population that is so young, it's so aggressive. And so viscocanalosomy actually works in that group because they started pressures of 40, 45, and their outflows are different. And so that's why his data was not transferable to the United States and why he got a fairly bad name uh, academically because they did, a lot of people just didn't believe his data because they couldn't reproduce it. I, don't th I think the problem was they just don't have that population. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And you look at it, every one of his patients in that, that paper he did for AJO, and it was pretty, pretty interesting. <coughs> But at any rate, one of the things that's come out of that is canaloplasty, which, which we do here. Um, and uh, we have a nice, the canaloplasty is a microcatheter that goes all the way around. I'll just sh quickly show you a little video, get to it. Uh, you can inject viscocanalostomy. The hope eventually is maybe we can figure out a, a drug. Uh, David might be able to do this to figure out a drug that we can put in um, to uh, the Schlem's canal to either increase outflow or, or you know, rotor root the, the canal so, so it works better. Um, and you basically pass it around. I'll just get to the video. There's a lot of evidence, uh, laboratory evidence, that it acts like pilocarpine uh, because you we're going to put a stent in the procedure. This was work before he passed away of Johnson, um, <coughs> showing that whenever he put the tension on the Schlem's canal, the outflow increased. When he lowered the tension, it decreased. This was at, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and so what we do, let me just show you one of those. This is an internal view of, of some of the patients with the, with the stent. You can, again, do laser gonio gonioplasty. So this is just to show you, I've already made the inner wall. So you're basically doing a viscocanalostomy, but instead we're gonna do it for 360 degrees. The little red heat is a, um, uh, allows you to track it as you move around. So what I'm gonna do is I'll turn off the, vi I'll turn off the, the um, microscope light here in just a second, and then we'll, we'll kind of, Move ahead because I don't, I don't want a little press for time. I want to show a couple other things. So basically, what we're going to do there's there it is in Schlem's canal, and you can watch it go all the way around. And then what I'll do is I'll tie a, uh, a tenoproline suture to it and put it, leave it in Schlem's canal, and then you put the tension on. And the problem is you have, you have to raise the pressure high enough so you don't put, you don't tighten it too much. So we you, and some of the pediatric guys are actually using this now to do the internal goniotomy is a really beautiful way to do that. But it's so it's uh, gone all the way around the eye, and it's in, so it's in Schlem's canal all the way around, and then we'll just tie the suture to it, and then pull the suture all the way around, and then get to the end here. And, you and sometimes it's at, uh, the issue, of course, is what whether the correct tension, so what we do is we have a uh, ultrasound that we can use at the time to make sure that we're in Schlem's canal, to make sure that we get some, some distension of it so that, as you can guess, this is not a 20-second uh, procedure. This is a bit of this is the ultrasound, which is a, a beautiful way we can identify a lot. Uh, Schlem's canal is a very low-acting uh, product, so but it's a good way. I'm going to I'm going to show you um, uh, one of the again. This is from Bob Steg Robert Stegman. It's one of the most amazing videos you, you're ever going to see, I think. Other than that other one that that I borrowed from him. Okay, there it is in Schlem's canal going around, you can just see the, the device, it's unbelievable. If you haven't ever, so this is the uh, external and then you s the, the, uh, the other stuff is the internal stuff as it goes around Schlem's canal. And uh, let's just move it ahead a little bit. So here's pulling out, same, same way. This is the tightening, trying to figure out exactly. And they're working on ways of trying to, to figure that out, but it's, again, it's, th it's technically a difficult procedure and there it is inside the eye. So this is the end of the procedure. There's the decimase window, and you can laser that. So if it's if it's too tight, you can pop it with a with the ad, and then you can open up Schlem's canal. So you've, uh, these are ways of working it at at this level. So the canaloplasty is an interesting device. Uh, let's look at ELT. This is the one that the, it is actually in 
and done really well in Germany. Um, one of our ex-fellows uh, is doing a lot of these, and it, it seems to work quite well. It's an internal opening that blasts through, but it's again, it's it's an opening. Uh, the trabectome we have here, I haven't been too thrilled with the outcomes, but basically what you're doing is you're, is you're doing a goniotomy with a, with a cutting device. I'll show you a little, here's a video of this. So you just go in, let's just don't bore everybody with the glaucoma. We, we get pretty excited about this stuff. But and most of these are, are done at the end of the cataract surgery. That the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, one, of the, one of the issues that we're gonna have is uh, possibly who, 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 ha who, who, if you use it on somebody who has, say, mild or ocular hypertension and get a good result, it's gonna be hard to look at data once it hits the, the big group. And that, that has a, so it's a cutting, you put that into Schlem's canal, and then, then there's a there's a electrocautery that basically cauterizes it. Nick, have you seen any eyes that have had this? I don't I don't think I have either. So this is just you just to show you the the device that goes in. And you can you can actually if you move it around you could obviously do all, almost the whole thing, but most of the time we do about 120, 130 degrees. And it, so you activate the foot pedal and it just cuts as it goes around. And generally what's happened is at least in uh, rabbit eyes and, and most eyes, the, the problem is usually turns out you get generally scarring that comes later. So it's like a, it's like an internal goniotomy. So let's go. The, this is the one that what that has last two weeks ago was received FDA approval, and this is the this is the um, micro stent, the eye stent, and it is so it the the tr the thought is to place uh, in actually in Unfortunately, in the United States, you get one for seven hundred and fifty dollars, and they they're selling it in Germany and every every place else in the world. They put three in because they're trying to find trying to luck out and put it towards hopefully near a, a, an outflow facility. When you when you do, when you just place it randomly in the eye, and it's almost always nasally. It's all always done, almost always done in combination with cataract surgery. Uh, it's technically pretty easy to do. Uh, We'll be doing these in about three weeks here because it just received FDA trials. I was in the one of the early trials about 10 years ago, but it took them a long time to, to, to get it done. And basically what you do is you put it into Schlem's Canal, and it's got these little uh, anchors that prevent it from migrating. Uh, and then the, the, so you're bypassing the ductal cantilicular tissue. And I say, this is, a, this is one in the eye. So you can see it's easily in Schlem's canal, and y you know you can identify obviously the the canal and look for sl uh, scleral spur. And we put it in the top third of the of the PM, so it comes in pretty easily. Here's one. There's two in the eye. This is this is uh, basically what's being done everywhere else in the U.S. But they can't, of course, say that. The problem is, is you only put one in, you get two and a half millimeters compared to phacal only. Now, there is data that shows that for each point over a five-year uh, lifespan that, that there's, there is de significant decrease in, in the uh, mean deviation for on uh, visual fields. So one point or two points does make a difference long term, but does it really, you know, it's, it's pretty hard <laughs> to prove, but it, the, that was from the Aegis data the advanced glaucoma intervention study. So it is something to, to think about, and, and but what we're working on, we will be doing an eye stent versus hydrus study here. And let me get to the hydrus. Let's get out of this, because I, I know we're running out of time. I just want to show you a hydrus, what that is. So, uh, so Ivantis is already FDA approved, and uh, let's go to that. So the hydrus is the, is the eye stent on steroids. So what it's going to do is it's going to take, it's going to cover almost 90 degrees. Uh, and it's a material that is pretty biocompatible. This is, so the eye stent's here, the hydrus is here. Uh, so you, there's, I don't think there's any way you can miss outflow by putting it in, in 90 degrees. And it's technically not too difficult to do. You can see he injects it in. So these are the, uh, these will be the outflow into, uh, device into into um, the outflow system 
and then this will be facing the, the TM. I think I have a video here. So basically this is what it looks like in the eye. And let's see, here's, here's one. Okay, so we'll just see this device going in. So it's similar, so it's very similar to the eye stent. You put it in. I do have an eye stent one, but that's, this one I think is a little bit more interesting to look at. So you identify the anatomy, you rotate the patient's head 90, about 45 degrees, and you, and you tilt your, your microscope back. There you can beautifully see uh, Schlem's canal. And you indent with this uh, injection device. And so this, this adds about 10 minutes to a, to a cataract procedure. Um, and the initial, the phase one set trial is done. The phase two is almost completed right now. And we're gonna go be in a second part of phase two um, for that. So there it is going into Schlem's Canal. And so the, the, the theory is you're, you're increasing physiological outflow and uh, it's something that could be done at the end of the procedure. Now, if you look at the data that w where just phaco reduces pressure, this probably, uh, at least in the initial step, is going four, or five, six points lower than when compared. So the first trial was, was this versus phaco, and that's one that's ongoing now in the United States. It's been done everywhere else. And then the second one, the one that we'll be in, is eye stent versus, versus hydrus. So we'll, we'll be comparing, we're gonna put We've got the, we're gonna put two in, so Hydrus is gonna buy two of them for us so we can at least compare it to, to at least what's used in the rest of the world. So it, it's an interesting time. Uh, there'll be a lot of, uh, there's a, the initially, uh, it's Chris Cocotera, by the way. That's, he's the, that's his, yeah, he, the, he's the CEO of, of uh, Glauco. And uh, so what they've done is they've, they've been, they're, a, they're a, it's a, one of those out, uh, similar to what he did, did at AMO, there's about 200 people in the United States that can use it to start with. And then when that data comes in, then they'll, they'll sell it to everybody. But I think things like this we'll see being used at the time of cataract surgery. And that's gonna be, that's the AGS's uh, point is that it's probably gonna be overused. So there's, there's already negative of press that's going out. I just wanted to bring this up now. So if you hear, you'll hear both sides of the story. It certainly is technically easy to do all of these, uh, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's the hydrus, so the eye stent comes at $750 per, per stent. In, in Europe, they're selling them two for a thousand or something like that. So the, they're averaging two to three. These are, uh, so they're n it's not, it's a significant increase in, in the cost of the procedure. And the hydrus will probably be at around, my guess is around 1500. They don't know for sure what they're gonna put it at. If the data is significantly better than the eye stand alone, then they'll, they'll probably go up higher than that. So, and that's a, that's a new startup company that we'll see who buys them. <laughs> but they have, they have good research going on, so it's good stuff. So, I think there's a, it's a pretty exciting time in, in glaucoma. Um, but I think probably in still in f certainly in five years and probably ten. Is that BYU or? <laughs> Come on, Joe. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I th we'll still be doing trabs, uh, so, and uh, goniotomies and all the other stuff, but it's, uh, the, the technology's getting there. And, and the exciting thing for me, being the FACO guy who, who saw the incredible changes that occurred from 73 to 2012, it's unbelievable every two months something's different. And finally, the glaucoma group is coming into that realm. So there's lots of innovation, so there's no innovation other than you know, how to cut a little bigger hole or, you know, outflow modulation. So this is pretty exciting stuff and I think uh, we'll be, so you'll be hearing from us when, when, the, when, this, when the trials start, we'll be looking for patients basically that are mild, uh, mild to moderate, uh, mean deviation in the minus eight range, somewhere uh, zero to minus eight range. Uh, ocular hypertensives, if you think they're at high risk, would be okay for the study. Um, and then we'll look at the surgical outcomes in a few years, and maybe five years from now we'll have another procedure. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Nick? That's, cor that's correct. That's correct. Yeah.
It's a it's a turf it's a turf battle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they yeah, that's a, that's exactly the point. Yeah, they they it's a turf battle for them. You know, th in the past everybody's so th th where where the AGS is saying that sort of their politically correct term that is we think it'll be overused. Uh, but I, you know who cares if it works? Yeah. Uh, o this only been studied in one of the cases. You know, uh, Weinreb's lab has has the ability to look at. Th they haven't looked at the actual outflow, but they looked at pressure at nighttime, and it and it they do w they do work at nighttime, and this it stabilizes the pressure. All seems to stabilize the pressure all day. So it's probably, it, you know, the the outflow studies at nighttime are hard to hard to do um, without lights and stuff. But they have a sleep lab there at. at uh, UC Davis or UC or San Diego, San Diego, yeah. Yep, yep. Randy? No, it's, it's really exciting to see. I think the road built yeah. used to be that the defendant would come straight out from all over San Diego and make a U and then use the defendant in the crowd to keep the low, keep people at view of junk and dirt or water and the road. Second time I saw a hundred plus of those things, first time I drove my car. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was the it's same. It's a very interesting exciting thing. And, yeah. and uh, we want to keep the, keep the company in the highway from the normal road. Correct. Correct. Uh, so it's, it's exciting to see the, uh, the growing of new standards and the yeah. things coming along. And yeah. the one person in particular that ran out of the front. Yeah, that's all. You know, the, 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 and the biggest problem with uh, five years, seven, d seven years. We won't know, really, if it's how effective it is. That's not true. That's not the case. And, and, uh, and yeah. probably earlier construction of that in the future than the present day. Correct. Yeah. The construction of snow as opposed to yeah. you know, just walking through the street on the grass and things like that. So it's uh, right. pretty interesting. The other big thing I see that's changed, that will change, is that a lot of our Los Angeles patients, uh, uh, we know that there are a lot of things that are going on, especially with the extreme weather and other uh, uh, things. Right. That's what we've been finally getting over the next couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big shift yeah. Shift. Right. That's what I was talking about with the with the inside there. And I think the um, um, the other thing too is that it's been shown now that everything that we do to improve blood flow, exercise, non-smoking. You know all those, all that stuff. Uh, management of the hypertension improves uh, visual outcomes. So you know we're now spending a lot of time talking about uh, uh, activity-based uh, stuff for our patients as well. You know omega-3 oils, all that stuff does does make a difference. So I, I thought this one of the latest things was that the uh, pressure lowering. Yeah. Possibly, that's correct. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah. And 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 not lowering pressure at nighttime, Bl blood pressure, right. big deal. So I right, when yeah. 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 That's r that's real. That's real. And so, and one of the uh, what we what I do is yeah. Yeah, and nighttime. So we're, I'm asking the most of the bad ones. I'm asking them to take their their medicines not at nighttime, and working with the uh, family yeah, practice care. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Judith. Right. 
Yeah. Yes, you can, yeah. But the the problem is, uh, it, it, while there are no there are no approved dyes to do that, you can actually do that. You could use Trifan Blue, for example, and inject it. They and that has been certainly been done in in animal models. The University of Nebraska, um, where uh, Carl uh, used to be a cameras there, his lab has done a lot of that work, and uh, they're they're part of the Hydrus development group because of that they figured that but they it's it's variable it seems to work at different times during the day some channels are open and, and the other problem is if you're doing it at the time of surgery it's 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 hard to get it all the way around it's a lot of the, uh, so you uh, technically theoretically you could do that but we have we don't have anything that's that we can put in to see those channels easily at the time of surgery you can do it in the laboratory easily and that's basically what they've done is just try to identify where the most likely it turns out that most of them are more of them are nasal Turns out they shut off during different times during the day. So it's, it would be hard to find, that would be great if you could do that. One thing that, th that we know is that if you gonioscope them at the time of surgery and they have a lot of pigment, you can see areas where, the, where there's thick pigment. That, it, those are outflow channels. So you can get them close to that. So there are some cases where it's pretty easy to see where, where there probably is. And if you're within a millimeter or two, it seems to help. Yeah. Yeah. So why all these uh, treatments for the new seven thousand different diseases and all that stuff? Yeah, that, that's what I'm. The, the new, the new, the eye pass, and um, uh, some of the and the hydrus are, are are materials that are in that range. I, I'm not sure what they cover them with, but they're the the eye pass, the one that's going to go into suprachoroidal space, is very biocompatible. It's the same material. The company that that owns the the they, it's a cardiology company that ended up making those stents. Yeah. And they drug them into the outflow yeah. and they actually yep. put the drug into the channel. Yep. Yeah, they do. But again, we'll see what happens. To the, uh, similar to that space, the supracoidal space, is a lot of blood flow there. It's uh, not an easy area. We, they used to do, of course, cyclodialysis as a surgical procedure. It worked beautifully or they were hypotenuse or it didn't work. <laughs> about 30, 30, 30. And you can never figure out who the hell it would work on. They are. The, uh, the other two are, are just like stents, and, the, and it turns out that the eye stents, you can um, maybe with some of the new, the, even the eye, uh, excuse me, the, the, the uh, mini shunt is, e and it's much larger than these, is, bio is MRI compatible. And they're looking at the, I guess the new Tesla coming out is going to be a little higher, and they'll have to redo their studies on that, but everything that we have now, all everything we're putting in there is work is okay, everything.